that we have uh, for the last talk for this first day. We've got Marcel van der Brink from New York, Sloan Kettering, who is a distinguished investigator, a clinician, both in the field of EBMT, BMT as well as uh, immunotherapy. Uh, you have a broad interest all the way from infectious disease to the way how it modulates immunotherapy and our immune response. And I'm looking forward to your talk, Marcel. Thank you very much. So I guess this is the Monty Python moment at this meeting, because now for something completely different. Um, and it gets even more painful than that, because um, we do build also a car cells within my lab, maybe not so fancy as some of the other things that you've heard. Um, and if I think about the question that I was given, the answer is, we don't really know yet. So we could go straight to all of the drinks, but um, let me tell you what we think might be helpful if we want to try to answer this question. And that does mean that I have to take a, a detour to allogeneic transplant, but I promise you, towards the end, we'll be back to car cells. So hang in there. Um, the first thing that I have to tell you honestly is that there is a conflict of interest here because um, part of the work that I will be showing you was actually sponsored by the company uh, Cirrus. This thing is a little bit slow. I'm not sure if I still need to show this a slide. I think so many articles have been showing over the last decade or so uh, that there's a clear impact of all of the microorganisms that live inside and outside of you on health and on, patho patho uh, and on pathophysiology. So that has led to this uh, theory that you could talk about a multi-species symbiotic supraorganism that is made up of human cells and microorganisms. So that's sort of the starting point that hopefully you can um, carry with you while we're gonna listen to all of this. Um, you know that you've really made it within cancer if, um, if your field is being entered into the latest version of this um, critical article, Hallmarks uh, of Cancer. So in their latest version, they now also mention mic microbiome. And they basically touch on a number of uh, subjects here. Um, of course, they are talking about the intratumoral microbiome and how that could impact on the tumor growth and so on. What is relevant for my story is that it can also impact on uh, immunity and on therapies. So we started to get interested in this field in uh, 2009, and the current leaders of our group are listed here, Jonathan Pellet, Tobias Hall, Ying Tower, Justin Cross, and Zhao Xavier. And we have collected by now more than 19,000 samples from more than 3,300 uh, patients, which has really helped us to constantly go back and ask different uh, questions and do different types of uh, sequencing and metabolomics and so on. So this is the group within my lab that is just focused on microbiome. Um, it started as a mouse group mostly, but now it has um, exploded into a group that is also doing uh, trials and, f uh, and core functions, um, a nutritionist, computational uh, uh, biologist. I never thought that I would turn my lab into sort of a Harvard a chemistry lab with 50 uh, people, but that's where we are now. So this is a um, summary of basically about 14 years of uh, work from our group and from other uh, groups uh, that has looked at how different clades, so different uh, taxa within the gut flora could, uh, um, could impact on outcomes after allogeneic uh, transplant. In many cases, it is only an association. In some cases, we have some uh, mechanisms. But what is striking is that there are basically links with every uh, clinically relevant outcome after allogeneic transplant. And the colors, of course, indi uh, indicate that blue is good and red is bad. So just to give you a few of the highlights, because I will need that for my story. So one of the early studies that we did um, showed that specifically patients who do poorly after an allogeneic transplant have a loss of their uh, commensal anaerobes. And one of the keystone uh, bacteria there is this one, Blaudia. And as you can see here, patients who in the first weeks after the allogeneic transplant have very little left of these uh, commensal anaerobes. Uh, have a much greater incidence of lethal aggraft versus host, uh, with, of course, much worse outcomes. 
but those were smaller studies, and most of the studies on that uh, cladogram were relatively um, small from single centers often. So we're very happy when a group of uh, colleagues from all over the world were willing to work with us to do a much larger study, which I will very briefly uh, summarize because it's all uh, published. Um, and now we were able to look at almost um, 1,400 uh, patients from four different uh, centers, uh, patients who were getting an allogeneic transplant for all of the typical uh, reasons such as AML and MDS. Um, the first thing that was really striking is that at all four centers, you would see immediately when these patients come in for the allogeneic transplant, a quick drop in the uh, diversity of their gut flora. And that was a true everywhere. Didn't, measure, uh, didn't matter what kind of uh, regimen was actually used. And that drop in the uh, diversity, if you would look specifically at a, a time point about 14 days out from allogeneic transplant, which is the, which is the average time for neutrophil uh, engraftment, was linked um, to worse or better outcomes. And that held up both in the uh, discovery uh, cohort and a uh, validation cohort made up of the other three centers. The other thing that was very striking is that, first of all, at all four centers, patients come into transplant. So this is only looking at the first sample that we get from them uh, with an um, injury to their mi microbiome. And one of the ways that you can measure that is, again, showing that they have lower, uh, that they have lower uh, diversity levels um, at that point. And going into transplant with lower uh, diversity was, again, linked to worse outcomes. Um, we took this to auto a transplant. This was a joint study with our colleagues from Duke, and we saw exactly the same. The moment that an auto a transplant patient comes in for his or her a transplant, you see a drop in the diversity, and that is again linked. If you look at that time point, which is about nine to twelve days out of the neutrophil uh, engraftment, having a lower diversity is linked to worse outcomes measured here, both with uh, PFS and OS. With that comes um, something else, and that is that almost all of these allogeneic transplanted patients at one point will be dominated within their gut flora uh, with a certain taxa, with a certain bacteria. Um, and you see here that the bacteria, the taxa that most commonly does that all over the world, as far as we can tell, uh, for patients getting an allogeneic transplant, is Enterococcus, and we uh, did some extra studies uh, showing that it's specifically an Enterococcus faecium species, uh, but that seems to be the bacteria that most uh, prevalently does that. And if that happens, if during the course of your allogeneic transplant you have at one point a state of dominance with, entero, uh, with Enterococcus, then that is linked again to worse outcomes, specifically an increase in lethal graft versus host. Uh, we like to uh, take these questions into mouse models, and when we did mouse modeling for this, and I'm only uh, summarizing it now, we saw actually in those mice developing a graft versus host that about one week into it, they had a blooming of enterococcus. We were trying to analyze why that happens, and I'm just uh, summarizing that uh, here. What we found is that the damage to the enterocytes, which is a primary uh, target cell during a graft versus host, um, but is also damaged from the uh, conditioning, that that leads to lower levels of this a protein, REC3, which is an antimicrobial protein that can actually uh, contain Enterococcus. We also see specifically in the ileum that these damaged enterocytes make lower levels of a lactase. That means that the intraluminal levels of lactose will go up. Lactose is the, is the nutrient for Enterococcus. So now you, have a, now you have already two factors that sort of uh, support the outgrowth of Enterococcus. We found some other ones after we published this article, which I won't get into. But what it leads to is a pushing away of the uh, commensal flora. We and others have demonstrated that one of the beneficial things during a graft versus host is that the uh, commensal flora can make uh, butyrate. Butyrate is a, a short-chain fatty acid that is an intraluminal uh, nutrient for the enterocytes, so the health of the enterocytes is now further damaged because there are lower levels of uh, butyrate. So this is sort of a downward spiral that these mice and these patients, we think, uh, get into, and that is why you get worse graft versus host. 
There are probably many other factors that are relevant here, but this is what we could figure out with these mouse models. Now, I pointed out that you saw these increased levels of lactose happening in these mice and that that was a nutrient that was critical for enterococcus. So uh, the postdoc who did all of this work, uh, Christoph Stein uh, Thuringer, went to the local pharmacy, I'm not kidding you, and bought uh, lactate and put that into the cultures and could actually demonstrate that with that he could totally uh, block the outcrowd of enterococcus. So what, what he did then is, and it was actually uh, difficult, he had chow made that was lactose free because lactose is almost everywhere. But he was able uh, to get that. And when he put mice in uh, two different models for a graph versus host on lactose free diet, he could show that he didn't see that outgrowth during graph versus host of enterococcus anymore. And he saw better outcomes also in terms of um, graph versus host uh, uh, mortality. Um, I recently found out that some people, after they saw this, have already changed in certain transplant centers their uh, practice to putting patients on lactose-free diets. I think that's a little bit fast. I think we should do a trials for that, but uh, that's, of course, what we are planning. So what are the other variables that we think are critical for these dramatic changes within the gut, gut flora? I would like to emphasize also in all of the studies that you see published about changes in gut flora. Transplant is the one where you can measure day-to-day -day, uh, uh, changes. You don't see that in any other study almost that is looking at hunters and gatherers in Africa or whatever studies. Um, so that's also why we did a lot of daily sampling and really try to analyze all of the variables that are uh, critical. One of the first ones, of course, that we looked at was um, antibiotics. And when we looked back on almost 900 uh, patients and looked at the use of different types of antibiotics, two really stood out. These are, two, the, these are the two broadest spectrum antibiotics, piperacillin tazobactam and imipenem. Um, and we saw that they were linked if patients got that type of antibiotic during the course of their allogeneic transplant with an increased risk for lethal graft versus host. Again, as I said, we like to model that then in a mouse model, and we saw again that um, mice that were developing a graft versus host, if we, during a similar interval as during clinical transplant, if they were treated with one of these broad spectrum antibiotics, in contrast to other types of antibiotics, that they would have worse a graft versus host. We could analyze that then in these mouse models in terms of what happens actually. Well, a few things that we noticed. There was a greater loss, again, of the commensal anaerobes, but an outgrowth of another uh, bacteria, Acromensia. That is a mucolytic uh, bacteria that lives right next to the uh, mucus layer and literally eats up the uh, mucus layer. We could measure that these mucus layers were indeed uh, uh, thinner and that that would lead to a loss of the gut barrier function. We saw some other changes within the large bowel specifically that I won't get into, but these are all known cytokines and findings that fit with worse graft versus host. So that was a whirlwind tour through some of the published work in allogeneic transplant, because I want to drive home a few of the points that we learned from that. So it's the loss of the diversity that seems to be linked, at least in allogeneic transplant, with worse outcomes. Specifically, the loss of the commensal anaerobe bacteria, and Blaudia seems one of the protective uh, keystone commensal anaerobes. Then I told you about the dominance of enterococcus, how that is linked to a graft versus host, and that specifically uh, the use of certain really broad spectrum antibiotics that are frequently used in allogeneic transplant patients and other settings uh, for patients with fever and neutropenia, that they are linked to worse graft versus host. Okay, a few more things that I want to tell you from allogeneic uh, transplant from not published uh, data uh, that could be relevant if we want to study what happens with car cells and micro, microbiome. Not that we have done that already, but I think it will be relevant. So the first thing is the uh, conditioning uh, regimens. Of course, all of these allogeneic uh, transplant patients get different types of uh, conditioning regimens. Uh, for those of you who are uh, transplanters, you know that we roughly categorize that in three strengths, myeloablative to non-myelo, um, and you see them here all uh, lined up. 
and how much impact they might have of the uh, diversity. And as you kind of expected, the non-myeloablative uh, regimens gave you a, a less of a loss of uh, diversity. That was bad English. Um, another factor that is, of course, really relevant is diet. Um, and we analyzed that in uh, two ways. So first is the uh, classical way of analyzing it, when you look at calories and proteins and fats and fibers and all of these things, and I could give you 10 diff different slides basically showing that indeed more fiber is good and higher calorie intake, as you see, is good, leads to greater levels of uh, diversity, higher levels of blaudia, lower levels of enterococcus. But we, but we also did a different way of analyzing it, and that is looking at all of the food uh, products in a uh, taxonomy and analyzing if certain food uh, products were maybe linked to worse or better outcomes or changes within the uh, diversity. And there we saw some interesting things that, for instance, fruits and sweets and the sugars, typically the kind of juices, etc., that we offer to our allogeneic transplant uh, patients when they can't eat very, very well, that they were actually linked to a greater loss of the uh, diversity. And we studied that in, in some more detail. There's actually evidence that these kind of simple sugars can specifically uh, propagate the outgrowth of certain uh, pathogens. We looked for that, and indeed we saw that fruits and sugars and sweets will lead to a greater um, outgrowth of, again, entro, uh, enterococcus, for instance. So, um, so these are the ways that we have to think in a more a sophisticated way about what the diet can actually do to uh, microbiome. And then, of course, all the other drugs. Any allogeneic transplant patient at any given moment is on six, seven or more uh, drugs. Um, so what we did there is we developed an algorithm to analyze that. Oh, some interesting changes here. Um, and that was done by a very talented a graduate student who worked with one of the computational uh, biologists um, in our team. What she did is she took a large uh, sample set, put it into a UMAP, and saw different uh, clusters forming. So, for instance, the first three uh, clusters, trust me, this should read high diversity in uh, hieroglyphs or whatever. Um, and so these are mostly samples from in the early going of a, a transplant. And all of the green here, for instance, are patients who are completely dominated with enterococcus. If she looked at it um, in this way, she could see about 10 different clusters uh, forming. Um, and then she looked very carefully, since we had daily sampling and daily drug data, at what do stopping and starting certain drugs do changes um, within these uh, clusters. And so she could figure out what was the uh, transition either staying into, in, um, in that same cluster or going to another uh, cluster. And when she did that, then she could suddenly see that many drugs can have impact on changes within the intestinal uh, flora. This here, these red, this red bar here, indicates some of the commonly used types of antibiotics. But all of these other uh, drugs, and we looked at about 60 different uh, drugs that are uh, frequently used, can also have impact. And there is actually some data from uh, studies where people took a whole list of FDA uh, drugs um, and then took 40 uh, frequently found uh, commensal uh, bacteria and saw that many drugs, not just antibiotics, could um, impact on the growth. When we took that uh, data set and we put it next to this da data set that we have from our patients, we saw pretty much the same findings. But then you start to see very interesting things. Of course, you can analyze it in every way that you want, but I keep on going back to this theme of uh, dominance with enterococcus because we know that that's a bad one. Then you can see that not just an antibiotic like flagell, metronidazole, could lead to increased levels of en enterococcus, but also certain drugs that we use for nausea or other types of drugs. So, this might have impact on the choices of some of these drugs that we use for, uh, for the motility of the gut or for nausea or for pain, pain medications um, and so on. And here you see the opposite, drugs that actually are favorable in terms of keeping the levels of enterococcus down. So that's, uh, that's a different way of looking at all of this. And 
we can now uh, predict based upon the um, exposure to certain uh, drugs what is going to happen with enterococcus levels, for instance. And when we tested that, then we saw indeed that the uh, prediction matched with what we found in the actual samples, but also that we could uh, predict already how this could impact on overall outcomes and survival specifically. We're, I don't know how many minutes into it, 20 minutes or so, and finally we get to a car cells. Um, you were wondering. So this is a study that we did with Penn, um, and some of the authors actually on this list are sitting right here, Sarah, Dr. Branches, who is looking at his phone because he wants to check some emails, but uh, they were all part of this uh, study. Um, and the whole reason why we did this is because from the data that I showed you from allogeneic uh, transplant and data that had been uh, coming off over the last years about what the microbiome can do to a checkpoint uh, blockade, we thought it was a logical uh, question to also see if it could have any impact on, um, car, uh, on uh, car T cell outcomes. So Melody Smith was the one who led this study. She has since then moved on and has now her own lab um, uh, at Stanford. And she did uh, two things. The first thing is she uh, collected data about uh, the use of antibiotics in patients getting car cells at Penn or at MSKCC um, in the four weeks prior to getting your uh, car cells. I should say I left that whole uh, table out. These were all CD19 car uh, that, that we were looking at, mostly, if not all, uh, commercial. I think there were a few experimental ones, but, but very low, low numbers. This was mostly the usual uh, commercial uh, cars that we know very, very well. Um, so in that first uh, cohort, she had now about 228 uh, patients, and she was interested to, uh, to see if that um, exposure in the first four weeks prior would have impact on changes within the flora and on outcomes. And that was based also on these kind of studies that had looked at, for instance, a checkpoint blockade data and were summarized in a very large um, cohort study here, or cohorts, where they looked at 44 cohorts, took it all uh, together, and saw basically that exposure to antibiotics in the four weeks prior to getting your a checkpoint a blockade for a series of uh, cancers were linked to every worse outcome that you could think of. Um, so that was the starting point for her to look at that. And what she found was that there was indeed a signal for the exposure to any type of antibiotic, but that was relatively weak. Where she saw a really strong signal was those same th uh, types of antibiotics that I showed you in the context of allogeneic transplant that do the most damage to the commensal anaerobes. Piperacillin, Tazobactam, and Imipenem, and Miropenem, they, had a, uh, they were linked to a much worse outcome. Um, that was the uh, combined data for ALL and NHL. Um, and if you split it up, then um, you see that it held up both for ALL and for NHL. And if you looked at it with multivariate um, analysis, looking at various uh, variables, that whole signal still held up. Then, of course, she wanted to take a, a deeper dive at the uh, composition of the flora. For that, she had far fewer uh, samples, and I would argue that 48, you can just get sort of a first glimpse at what is going on. We need many more uh, samples. Um, and again, looking at what was known from the checkpoint blockade uh, literature, there were actually pro and con studies in terms of the impact of the uh, diversity, which I showed you was a very strong signal within the context of allogeneic transplant and Ottawa transplant, but not really um, so much in these studies in uh, checkpoint blockade. What she saw was that um, the that the first uh, sample that she looked at, so when patients come in for their um, car cells, uh, that there was a lower uh, diversity. She couldn't truly, really, but that is probably mostly because the numbers were so low, see a strong signal between lower diversity and worse outcomes. Um, so that certainly needs to be studied in more detail. And she saw that uh, these patients came in with a greater beta, uh, beta uh, diversity, which basically means that 
just like what we saw with these allogeneic transplant patients, that they come into their car cell therapy already with a most likely injured uh, microbiome from probably previous rounds of chemotherapy, exposure to antibiotics, and so on. So this is known from Checkpoint uh, Blockade. These were the back-to-back-to-back -back -back science articles uh, that all demonstrated in mouse and men that there were certain uh, bacteria that could be linked to better or worse outcomes. And the interesting thing is that people have looked at um, all these three studies, have tried to put all the data uh, together and see is there any common, uh, common signal here. But as you can see, each of the studies came up with different uh, uh, taxa. And even if they did some more uh, in-depth analysis, looking at more uh, pathways, or could not really find a common feature. Um, since those back-to-back-to-back -back -back studies, uh, many other studies have been uh, published, and it has all only made the uh, confusion a little bit greater, and has put some more uh, bacteria out there that could uh, potentially be uh, tested within the context of uh, checkpoint blockade. So what did Melody find? Well, certainly she had a whole bunch of uh, bacteria that in this small set could be linked with better outcomes if you look at day 100 uh, CR. And some of the ones that uh, ended pretty high in that list were also found within the context of a checkpoint uh, blockade. So maybe worth a further study, um, Ruminococcus and uh, Fecali uh, bacterium. Um, we did a shotgun sequencing so that we could also look at some uh, pathways. And one of the pathways that actually stood out as being favorable uh, is this one here that is part of Enterococcus faecium, pepto, uh, peptidoglycan biosynthesis. And that's really linked again with Enterococcus. And therefore, uh, we took a first uh, peek. Uh, of course, we have very few uh, patients here. What happens with CAR patients? who also have a period where they are being dominated with enterococcus. And when we did that and we looked carefully at all the exposure of different drugs, et cetera, we saw that all of these six patients had uh, toxicity and four of six went into a, a CR. So certainly something once we get more, more data that might be worthwhile uh, to look at in some more detail. So, for time's sake, actually, I'm going to um, skip this as summary and go immediately to where are we overall within the whole field in terms of therapies. Let me first tell you what my bias is. I still feel that we need to learn a lot more and that we need to be very careful, specifically with these fecal transplants, with normal healthy donor type of uh, transplants, when we don't really know what kind of flora we're actually giving. But we are guilty of having done some of those kind of uh, studies also. This is the way that you can think about targeting the microbiome. Um, the easiest and probably the first place to look at is uh, the use of antibiotics. Um, and I'll show you one of the trials that we are doing. Then you can think about a, pre <coughs> sorry, a prebiotic strategy where basically diet is being used first and uh, most of all as a drug to impact on the microbiome. Then, of course, where the field is mostly focused is in probiotics, so those are the fecal transplants and so on. And then another place where you could look is postbiotics, specifically looking at uh, products from the microbiome that are being felt or that, are, that could be of a benefit, for instance, uh, short-chain fatty acids. So what are we doing? We have, uh, within the context of allogeneic transplant, we have an, an antibiotic stewardship a trial uh, going on where we try to um, see what happens if we either treat patients in a randomized fashion with our current um, standard of care, which is the use of piperacillin teso tesobactin. That was the broad spectrum um, antibiotic that I showed you caused a lot of uh, harm to the uh, commensal flora, or one that does less harm to the uh, commensal flora uh, cefepime with some specialist strategies to wean patients a little bit earlier off the use of antibiotics. A trial that we uh, completed was an autofecal uh, transplant where we harvested um, feces before a transplant and then gave it back a couple of weeks after once patients came off their, um, off their antibiotics. <clears throat> that was a study that was uh, set up basically to uh, prevent a C. diff was a very small uh, study. As these things go, there was not much uh, C. diff, 
we, we did see another interesting signal, and that is that um, patients treated with an autofecal or transplant had a lower incidence of the activation of certain viruses, CMV, EBV, adeno, and so on. We're currently actually studying that in some germ-free mouse models to try to figure out how that um, interacts. And then there was, um, and, and then this is a study we recently opened, basically based upon our studies and studies by others, we selected 17 strains uh, for various types of benefits that they can improve numbers of uh, Tregs, can have some um, activity against Enterococcus, that they can be beneficial for gut barrier and so on. Um, and we hope to see uh, better outcomes with these uh, transplant patients if they're being uh, treated with this rationally designed uh, consortium of uh, bacteria. So with that, um, I'm going to stop. And what I've been trying to uh, tell you here is that changes in the gut microbiome are linked to pretty much every clinical uh, relevant outcome, uh, clinically relevant outcome after allogeneic transplant and also auto uh, transplant. Um, that these uh, changes are very much linked to drugs and diet and some other factors that we still have to uh, figure out. And that one of the common features uh, so far between CAR cells, checkpoint blockade, um, and allogeneic and auto transplant is that the use of broad spectrum antibiotics seems to be harmful. And with that, I'm going to thank, of course, my funding agencies, the various people in my group, and in other groups who have worked with us. And I'm going to stop. Thank you very much.